So uh, let's uh, repeat the model we had before to see what this Keynesian multiplier is all about. Uh, here we've got uh, the Keynesian con consumption function, uh, where I've made explicit now taxes. So we've got the disposable income and the tax rate taxes, or the tax rate appears as a as a decimal. It's exogenous, fixed by the government. It's based on uh, income, which is real GDP, means it has to go to somebody and it can be taxed. Notice that one minus t, uh, the opposite of tax rate, gives us disposable income. Total tax revenue is going to be small t, which is this uh, uh, decimal point, for example, let's say 10%. That means to say that if uh, real GDP or total income is 100 liters, then 10 liters would, would appear as tax revenue to the government, leaving disposable income as 90. Uh, something else now I'm adding in new, uh, the investment function, uh, Notice that in this case, I'm going to consider that the real interest rate is constant. But if we want, we can put a little plus sign in the top here, indicating that if disposable income goes up, that means consumption goes up. And if I want, I can put a little minus sign here, indicating that the, if the interest rate goes up, the real interest rate goes up, investment goes down. Number of projects get approved is smaller. Uh, but as I say, for what we're going to do today uh, in, this, uh, in, this, in this lecture, the interest rate is held constant. Uh, the next thing we've got is government purchases, which is also new. Uh, here I've set it at G naught, meaning to say it's exogenous variable at time zero, uh, and it's it's going to be a fixed, not fixed, but rather uh, uh, exogenous. December the prime minister, the minister of finance. Uh, we can put this together now in a, in a simple, two simple equations. We've got the aggregate demand uh, uh, function. This is planned purchases. I'm going to. I put in net exports here, but we've got a closed model, so we just ignore the net exports. We'll bring that in later. So uh, aggregate demand is composed of household consumption, based on the Keynesian consumption function, investments, which is dependent on the real interest rate, and then government purchases. Finally, I'm going to say that aggregate demand determines real GDP. In effect, well, we don't have any supply function here. We're not looking at who's going to supply this, uh, this yogurt or whatever. It's a bit like saying, um, we're going to go to households, ask how much they want to consume right now. We'll go to firms, ask them how much they want to invest. We'll go to government, ask them how much they want to have. And then that's the order we'll put into the, the helicopter guy with the pilot, and he's going to show up with all the pizza. Aggregate demand determines how much pizzas will be delivered. We're going to change all this in, in the future to make it a little bit more realistic. So I've uh, repeated all these, these functions uh, as before with maybe one little change is that I've indicated now the consumption function is this portion here, uh, which can be rewritten this way here, if you will. It means the same thing. So we've got the consumption, which is now the consumption function added into the aggregate demand, then I've got um, uh, given uh, investment, and then I've got government purchases. So I'm going to do a comparative static example uh, where I'm going to look at the situation, call it a snapshot at time zero, and then maybe one year in the future to see what happens as a result of one single change. So we call this comparative statics because it's a snapshot of the economy at a particular point at point A and then point B. We're not going to look at how the economy moves from point A to point B. That would make it a dynamic model. We're not doing that here. So sometimes it's considered uh, com comparative statics. So let's say it's st situation at time zero. I'm going to put some actual values for these uh, um, exogenous variables and these parameters. Now, I just made up these numbers. Uh, so that means to say that the, for example, the, the this is the tax rate which is 10%. This is the marginal propensity to consume, which we've seen before. And this is autonomous consumption is 26.8 liter. I don't know where I got these numbers. I just made them up. So uh, now I'm going to assume that the real interest rate is fixed. And at the real interest rate of, of whatever that number is, let's say it's 5%, uh, investment is going to be 12 liters. If firms want to approve projects such that there's going to be 12 liters each year or at any given time buried added to the capital stock, buried underground. Uh, this, in effect, makes, because the real interest rate is fixed, it makes investment an exogenous variable. Finally, to keep things simple, I'm going to say there is no yogurt parties. The government isn't going to be purchasing any kind of yogurt. So G is equal to zero. We put these various ideas together. We can see, first of all, this is the consumption function, where you'll notice I've taken the tax rate and put it into here, so that now 1 minus 0 0.1 times Y gives us, in effect, uh, disposable income. Next thing I've done is I've taken the marginal propensity to consume, put it in here as 0 0.6, and then finally I've got autonomous consumption, which is this 26.8 here.
That's consumption. If I put these all together, well, now I've still got consumption here. This is consumption, the same as above. This is investment. And this is government purchases, which is zero. Next step is to simply assume that aggregate demand is equal to real GDP. So if I add up these various 26.8 plus 12 gives me 38.8. 1 minus 0 0.1 is 0 0.9 times 0 0.6 gives us 0 0.54. I'm assuming that aggregate demand is equal to real GDP, so I can replace Y A D with Y, and we find and wind up with one simple equation with one unknown real GDP. Fooling around with these uh, numbers here, you can play around with the ar arithmetic, I guess it's algebra, and uh, it turns out that why not, I call it why not here because it means real GDP at time zero is equal to 84.3. That means to say, if, if we order 84.3 pizzas or liters of yogurt, we will have sufficient for the variables indicated above, the, the fixed parameters because of the consumption function, as well as the 12 liters we're going to have to have uh, to put aside for investment. I'm also assuming that the savings, that the amount people want to save is equal to investment. That's implicit in what we've written here. Now, let's go ahead to time one. So we're gonna jump one, one period in the future. Everything is the same. I'm gonna use the same autonomous consumption, same marginal propensity to consume, same tax rate. I've just repeated everything, but you'll notice one little change here. I've changed this G naught to G1. The interest rate stays the same, so investment is still at 12 liters. But now I'm going to say the government wants to have a yogurt party, so it's going to increase its purchases from zero to 10 liters. That's the unique change. When we now repeat the consumption function, we have exactly the same as before. Uh, once again, I can say that this portion here is the consumption part. This is going to be investment. And now you'll notice the G shows up as 10. Once again, I'm going to say that aggregate demand is equal to the amount of real GDP produced. This is a bit like saying that the economy is well below potential, so it's capable of producing whatever people order. Now, if I add up these numbers, 26.8 plus 12 plus 10 gives me 48.8 plus Again, 0 0.6 times 0 0.9, it gives me 0 0.54. You can verify those numbers. Uh, when I turn these numbers around, I find out that now Y, real GDP at time one, is equal to 100. In effect, this is the amount of yogurt we'd have to order from the helicopter guy to come and deliver to us so that all these planned purchases will add up to real GDP. Now, we can look at the Keynesian multiplier now in the following sense. At time zero, G naught is equal to zero, then it becomes 10. Real GDP is 84.3. Initially, it jumps to 106.1. So we can write the Keynesian multiplier as the change in real GDP due to the change in G, which is like saying Y1 minus Y naught, G1 minus G naught. Well, we know that the change in government purchases is 10, 106.1 minus 84.3. You can do the math. It comes out to be two. This is the what's called the Keynesian multiplier, which implies that if government purchases increase by a certain number, let's say five, real GDP would have to double or more than double. Now, uh, th this, of course, leads to, led to a, a much debate uh, in, in macroeconomic terms because the, impl the, the, the implication is that the government can make us all richer by buying stuff. And again, uh, uh, we're going to look at this in a little bit more detail to find out why this is the way it is, but keep in mind too that we're not looking at supply, we're only looking at demand. Uh, so first step in this is to try to see what this would be in theory without specific numbers. So I'm going to do this kind of theoretically, and I've repeated once again, here we've got the consumption function part here. This is C. I've got I and I've got in, in government purchases. Once again, I'm going to assume that the uh, uh, whatever you order, whatever you want, you get to, in terms of real GDP. Now, I'm, I'm curious to find out how G affects Y. So that, keep in mind, G is exogenous. Y is endogenous. It's going to be determined by the model. So uh, what we can do next is wherever we see G, we can change it to a change in G, and wherever we see Y, we can change it to a change in Y. You'll notice the little delta line, uh, 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 Greek letter here, it means change in. So let me rewrite these equations down below, once again, assuming that aggregate demand is equal to real GDP. And I can say, first of all, well, investment doesn't change because the interest rate isn't changing. So I can cross that out. Autonomous consumption doesn't change. I can stay, keep that. It doesn't change anything, so I'll, it's constant, so I can ignore it. 
Now, I said wherever I see a G, so I'm going to have to put a delta in here in front of the G because that possibly could change. I have to put a delta in before this Y here, and of course I have to add a delta over here. So I'm looking at now how changes in G could affect Y, changes in Y. So if I do that, and I've done it below, I've got delta Y is equal to C minus 1 minus T, delta Y plus delta G. If I rearrange these terms, I can move the minus CT over to the other side, to the left hand side of the equation. And now I can rewrite this as 1 minus 1 over C blah, 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 times Y is equal to delta G. Once again, rearranging, I can write it like this, where I've got delta Y divided by delta G. So this really is the Keynesian multiplier, is going to be equal to 1 over 1 minus, keep in mind what these are, marginal propensity to consume times the 1 minus the tax rate. And if I use the specific example we had a moment ago, this was equal to, and this was equal to the tax rate. And you can see that this is equal to 2.17. Oops, I've got that backwards, but if you do the math, you can see it. What we've figured out here is that this is the Keynesian multiplier in general. So if you want, you could write this equation down here and keep it on your cheat sheet in case I ask you a question about how to calculate the Keynesian multiplier without having to know the specific numbers or doing the whole model. You can use this very simply. One thing to point out a little bit is that if you see this a bit, if little c gets bigger, that's the marginal propensity to consume is equal to little c. If it goes up, then you can sort of see that this de uh, denominator, as a result, is going to get bigger. Think about it. As this gets closer to 1, this number here is going to get closer to, rather, get it, it gets smaller. And as a result, the Keynesian multiplier increases. Let me repeat that. If the marginal, imagine for the sake of argument that the tax rate is equal to 0. Okay, so there's no taxes. E tax is equal to zero. We could ignore this and sign entirely here. And then we've just got one over one minus the marginal propensity to consume. If the marginal propensity increases, gets closer to one, the denominator will get closer to zero, which means that the Keynesian multiplier as a whole will get larger. At the same, by the same logic, you can sort of imagine this. There's a minus here and there's a minus over here. So in the case of the tax rate, if the tax rate goes up, it's the opposite. The Keynesian multiplier will decrease. As I said, this was a source of a big political a political date, particularly in the 1950s, 60s, although even recently in the, in the financial crisis of 2008, I read several arguments discussing this so-called multiplier and whether it be effective or not. And uh, one of the key arguments about it was whether the marginal propensity is higher, how it affects the Keynesian, and how tax rates affect it as well. I want to finish with this idea of the tax revenue and government budget. Uh, recall in the previous example I had was the tax rate was 10% or little t is equal to 0 0.10. Uh, so when we did this calculation, uh, when we did initially uh, why not, remember why not was equal to 84 point, that was in time 0, 84.3. So as a result, we can say that given the tax rate, tax revenues would have been 8.4. This is real, so this is 8.43 liters received. But of course, at time zero, the government had no purchases of yogurt. So this means it was a budget surplus. What was the government doing with its 8.4 liters of yogurt that they received through tax revenues, but they didn't need in terms of government purchases? Well, presumably, they were refunding or paying back uh, the previous debt. So they were using this to, in effect, to refund bonds previously sold to people. Uh, if we look at time one, on the other hand, uh, well, now the tax uh, still tax rate is still 10%. Real GDP rose to 106.1. Here, I can write it here now, which means now that tax revenues at time one would be 10% of this number, which gives us a total tax revenue of 10.6. It's still greater than the 10 liters they need in terms of government purchases. So in this sense, it still represents a budget surplus, but a, a slightly smaller one than before. Uh, now, we don't have money in this model, so we can just ignore money in general, but what we can say by this also is that if government purchases are greater than tax revenues, then the government is selling bonds, borrowing, and we can say that the government, there's a government budget deficit. If, on the other hand, as in these two cases here, we've got a 
budget surplus. That's the case here. Although I have to say at time one, the surplus is smaller. Uh, we can say now that the government has, there's a government budget surplus. Be careful about this term deficit and surplus. We're talking specifically about the government budget. We're not talking about the country as a whole. We're not talking about foreign trade or anything like that. Mm -hmm.